it's the best of the rest. Time to put them to the test. In case your memory is hazy, it's black exploitation, baby. This is Black's History Month, a 29-day celebration of black exploitation films. Well, I guess I'm finally here. I put off talking about Ganja and Hess in 2022 in favor of Blackula because when I initially watched it, I had absolutely no idea what was going on. That's partially my fault because I went into the movie thinking it was going to be your standard black exploitation fair like the other movies I covered that year. In 2023, I put it off again and said, hey, Blackula has a sequel. Let me do that instead. If you can't tell, I've been avoiding talking about this movie for a while because I found it almost impossible to break down. But since this may be my last Black History Month, I figure it's now or never. It's interesting that I chose to talk about Blackula over Ganja and Hess because the producers of Ganja and Hess tasked writer and director Bill Gunn with making a black vampire film similar to Blackula. Which I know sounds weird because Blackula is a black vampire film. What they meant was a film with a black writer and director. So with not a lot of budget and experience mostly in playwriting, what did Bill Gunn come up with? It's probably better if I just try to lay out the plot for you. As I stated before, Ganja and Hess is a vampire film, but not in a traditional sense. I'll explain. Dwayne Jones is Dr. Hess Green, an anthropologist and collector of African artifacts. This was only Dwayne Jones' second film after being the lead in the iconic Night of the Living Dead. He was forever enshrined into the history of horror because he was a lead black man during a time when black men were rarely the lead, especially over white actors. He was bossing them around and everything in that movie. He's still great here, but he has way less dialogue to work with. He mostly gets by on emoting. Anyway, he meets up with and bonds with a man named George Mita, played by director Bill Gunn. They both share a love of artifacts, especially a weird looking ancient dagger and Mita agrees to stay at Dr. Hess's place for a while to assist him. Would have been nice to know that Mita was batshit insane before Hess agreed to let him stay there though. He's mentally ill and suicidal, and although Dr. Hess seems like a smart man, he's a straight up fool for letting this man stay in this place with the doors unlocked. He gets murdered with the ancient dagger for his mistakes, with Mita then shooting himself afterwards. However, the dagger is cursed to turn whoever gets stabbed by it into a vampire, but I feel like that title is misleading. Dr. Hess does drink blood, evidenced by him drinking the fresh meat meal on the floor, but he isn't vulnerable to the usual stuff like garlic, daylight, wooden steaks, all that other kind of stuff. Plus, he doesn't grow any fangs. Besides the blood drinking, there's no way to tell he's actually a traditional vampire. From here is where Ganja and Hess starts to lose me. Its low budget is evident from the start, but I don't have a problem with that. There's plenty of low budget movies that turn out just fine. However, Bill Gunn has a history in art, literature, and stage, so his spin on the genre is filled with hallucinogenic looking scenes and weird cutaways and oddly edited shots. You cannot take your eyes off of this movie for one second or you will miss the entire context of the scene. Hell, even if you watch it eyes glued, you'll still be confused as to what exactly is happening and how it ties to the story. Supposedly, it was meant to disorient you, to put you in the shoes of the characters. Sweet Sweetback did a similar thing, and I've always found that to be a delicate balancing act. Like for instance, Ganja and Hess makes use of these flashbacks to the African tribe that the dagger originates from. Nobody is talking about it at the time, it's not really even relevant to the story, but they go on for a very long time. Then there's the music and the score. I'm not saying it sucks, I'm saying it doesn't exist. This might be the quietest movie I have ever seen. Completely absent is any kind of background score or anything close to it. What little music we do get is this. God damn, it just burns from your ear straight into your soul, doesn't it? About halfway through the movie, Mita's wife shows up to Dr. Hess's house looking for him and when Dr. Hess tells her that her husband disappeared, she almost immediately falls for him with very little reason. Her name is Ganja, bringing together the other half of our eponymous characters. She comes across as mean and off-putting, but I actually like the character. 
Marlene Clark as Ganja is the most interesting person in this movie. Side note, I talked about Marlene Clark last year when I talked about Slaughter. She starred in that with Jim Brown and they died on the exact same day in 2023. What are the odds? Leonard Jackson from Five on the Black Hand Side also makes another appearance here as the butler, although you can hardly tell it's him. So ultimately, what's my problem with Ganja and Hess? Well, I must admit, I liked it a little more when I watched it again recently than when I first watched it, but I still don't think it's the classic underground exploitation film that it's hailed as. It's just way too abstract for me and requires entirely too much knowledge of the director's vision, filmmaking themes, and techniques to be appreciated by the average audience. There is stuff I like about it though, like Hess trying to figure out ways to satisfy his thirst for blood until he realizes he needs fresh blood. And I like some of the short anecdotes that two of the characters tell during the movie. I also like how the movie is a metaphor for drug addiction. But for everything that I like, there's a bunch more that I don't like. Ganja and Hess was well received by overseas art aficionados, and when you read about the movie online, it's like you're reading about a completely different film. But over here in the States, the critics hated it upon release, and for once, I actually agree with most of them. The reaction to this film made Bill Gunn a little disillusioned with filmmaking, and he only directed one other film after this. You might be unaware of this, but Ganja and Hess is one of the few exploitation films that was remade, but under a different name. It's called The Sweet Blood of Jesus and was directed by none other than Spike Lee. I actually watched that too, and you want to hear something crazy? Some of the same people who absolutely love Ganja and Hess hate The Sweet Blood of Jesus. Well, how is that possible? Because The Sweet Blood of Jesus is almost a scene for scene, shot for shot, line for line remake of the original with some very minor changes. It's less a remake and more a modern reshoot. The only thing that makes the two movies different is Spike Lee removed all the weird acid trip like imagery of the original in favor of more traditional cinematography and provided more context to each scene with better editing. Oh, and added some actual music. So basically, Spike Lee's version is the same film but with all the stuff I hated about the original removed. It's so similar that Bill Gunn was credited as a writer despite dying in the 80s. It's hard to say Ganja and Hess is a bad film because in a weird way, it's really not. It truly is art in cinematic form because just like any other kind of art, how you feel about it is purely subjective. I say watch it on your own and see if it's your thing. In fact, I think everybody should watch it at least once just for cultural significance. It deserves at least that much.